he wants to jump 1,000 cars. Sir, you have a 1,000 cars. I don't think I'd attempt to try this stunt. Or we, we owe this horsepower to Uncle Sam. <laughs> Too many cars. Car. You know, roses would be... Uh... Like, I put my beer belly on it. Yeah. You can't immediately tell somebody how many cars you have. You'll really give those uppity yuppies something to think about. Stay on the bar. Don't go yeah. off the bar with your Bronco. 1980 Volvo horns. What's right? Me, me. Yeah, only the man's coolant. <laughs> and he's like, oh, I thought it'd be small. It's for a small car. And I'm like, yeah, but it's, it's still an automatic transmission. They're never going to be light. It's definitely going to have to crash. Starting off with Brad buying another car. That's the West. <laughs> Internet. You know, is this a Nigerian oil print? Uh, I also wish you drove a tan Camry. Anyways, anyway, that, that's a, a horrible, very horrible podcast content. A very a inside joke. Welcome to Auto Off Topic. Hey, Brad. Good afternoon, Andrew. How are you today? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm wonderful. We're a uh, little bit late on our recording here, but that's okay. That's all right. We're going to have a special Monday release. So happy Monday, if you're listening to it on Monday. <laughs> or whatever day you listen to it. <laughs> happy day to yeah. you. Or night. Yeah. Or any time. I don't know. Whatever. Great start. What are you, what are you, what are you up to? Uh, so I haven't done a ton of car projects. Uh, I did finally ride the motorcycle after repairing it. I think I talked about putting it all back together. You did. So uh, does it work? It. I was a little bit nervous because it took a little bit to start. Oh. But then I was like, well, I did. Because remember, if you remember, I went to start it last time and the battery was dead. Right. So I charged the battery and I eventually got it to start uh, and it took a while to start. And I was like, well, that's not good. But then I was thinking about the fact that all of the fuel lines were empty and maybe that was part of it, I guess, maybe. Because it took a while to start and idle, but like I'd start it and it would stall and I'd start it and it would stall and I'd start it and it would stall. And I was like, well, this is acting like a carburetor. I don't like this at all. Maybe but, the ECU needs to relearn. When it finally did fire off, it flashed a check engine light and had a code. Um, wow, cool. And then I was annoyed because I don't have a code reader for a motorcycle because they're not OBD2. So I had to figure out what the code was by reading the code in the dashboard and some Googling. And I forget exactly what it was. But nonetheless, according to the internet, it would eventually go away. So I rode the motorcycle about 20 miles. And it seemed to run mostly okay, but at low idle, occasionally it would stall. And I was annoyed, <laughs> quite frustrated, actually. But then after about three key cycles and about 25 miles, the check engine light went off and the bike seems to run fine. So. Fixed, I guess. I guess so. It started up right after that normally, so I guess we're good. I haven't ridden it again since that time when it was full cold, like not starting from like a hot start. But yeah, I mean, everything seems okay. It rode okay. Um, sounds normal. I'm closing in on 3,000 miles, which is time for its first uh, valve adjustment. So I'll get that taken care of probably. I don't know, pretty busy the next couple of weeks, but hopefully the next couple of weeks I'll pass that 3,000 mile threshold into the valves. Yeah, they really were like, we'll give you a new vehicle. That is basically an old vehicle. A lot of motorcycles still require valve adjustments. That's not uncommon. This particular motorcycle requires them at a little bit more frequent of an interval than most. Most are like five to 10,000 miles. This is 3,000 miles, but it's a single cylinder, so it's not like it's ultra complicated. Um, so it's two, only two valves. Say, yeah, and most people say that you can do it once you've done it once, you can do it in 30 minutes in the future. So it's just like part of your oil change routine, basically. So whatever. I'm not worried about it. Do you like we'll to tinker? Have we got a bike for you? Yeah. Do, do you want to spend not a lot of money on a neat looking motorcycle? But also, do you like, do you mind tinkering a little bit? Or you could pay the dealer to do it, I guess, or your service. But it's probably a few hundred bucks, I assume they charge. And I don't. I'd rather not do that because that makes the discount motorcycle no longer a discount motorcycle, right? So, 
I don't know. We shall see. I'm not worried about it. The, the internet says it's easy. It's never lied to you before, has it? Oh, no. That's always true. It's <laughs> yeah. always easy. There's there's enough people I've seen that have these, that have YouTube channels that talk about them. Um, and you're able, technically... Uh, YouTube's always right, as well. Yeah. I'm going with the power of numbers here. Um, technically, you're able to complete the process with the included tools that come in the tool bag. So having nicer tools obviously makes it easier, but you can technically do it with those. So Yeah, so that when you're riding around the equator, circumnavigating the globe, you can adjust right. your valves. Well, I don't know if you ever heard of the YouTuber Itchy Boots. Nope. But she's a YouTuber who bought one of these brand new in India and rode it 25,000 miles or so across the world multiple times all over the place and has like photo or video vlogged the entire trip. She's actually fairly popular, like a big YouTuber in the adventure motorcycle world. But she did it on one of these and was able to complete these repairs in like hotel rooms in Mumbai. So I think I'll be okay. But anyway, time will tell. I wrote it again. I'm happy it runs. I'm not ready to sell it again yet. Give me another couple weeks. We'll figure that out from there. Besides, I have other products to worry about and other things to, to take care of. So tons and tons of stuff coming up. Next few episodes will have tons of updates, I assume, because I'll uh, preview our future topic here of this episode. The Prescott Rally was this past weekend, which kicks off the first of three weekends of car events in a row and next weekend is the route 66 japanese classic um from arizona japanese car club arizona classic japanese car club that's in williams next saturday and a saturday after that is the radwood show which is here at radford speedway so radwood at radford is uh, okay week after that and... so i get tons of prep to do for the New England people, people Peekable. that weekend is Japanese Car Day, which Two is big. Now? Yeah, the 15th, which is big okay. for listeners of this podcast. So for sure, if you're in New England and in our discord, most of us are going to try to go. So as long as it's for not like, sure. raining too much. Yeah. And it's a really good show, too. Like it grows bigger it is. every year. So. And cars come out that you have no idea exist in New England. Yep. <laughs> and it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Where does this car live? I think I think the first place I ever saw an AZ1 or a Z432 or a Pajivo or all kinds of stuff at that show. So good event for sure. So yeah, anyway, those big events are coming up and I have tons of prep work to do on the cars because between those events, almost every car is leaving the garage or the yard or wherever they're parked. So the plan is to take both the Corolla and the Colt to the Williams show, which is a bit of an adventure because it's probably two, two and a half hours away, which doesn't sound like much, but it's up in the mountains. So it require driving up pretty high in elevation on all kinds of switchbacks and getting it there. So that will be a bit of a challenge, but hopefully okay. And then for Radwood, the 944, the Mercor the Socorro and possibly even the Corolla are going to there. So I think the only car that's currently easily driven will be the Eclipse and the Cressida that are not leaving. Other than that, every car is used in the next two weeks. So tons of prep work to do. So, and actually, one of the cars will be probably featured in a booth at Radwood. So I need to make sure that it's 100% perfect for that. But we'll see. But yeah, that's a busy time coming up. Good times though. Can't complain. Tons of car stuff is good, right? That's what we that's what we want. Yeah, definitely. Sometimes wish it was a little more spread out because it always seems like things are on top of each other, but it is what it is. It does. It feels like we'll have like lulls and then like a bunch of events together. Yeah. Yeah, but all good. Have you done uh, any car work, Andrew? Uh have I done any car work? No, I haven't done any car work. I feel like that's a lie. I feel like last time I talked to you, you had an Outlander in pieces. Oh yeah, Just we did. Done. We did talk about that. So yeah, my dad and I, we finished that up. We actually ended up taking off the lower intake and just swapping out the the knock sensors for new ones because it was just easier. Sure. The there wasn't enough wire to really play with and get in there and splice it. It was just like, ah, eh. it's like 
if it's not a good splice, and then if the splice breaks from like vibration or something, then it probably would it probably would have been fine. Um, you know, then you yeah you end up with a bad knock sensor. You got to do it all over again. So we're just like whatever, just take it down. It's also one of those things that we learned like it would be hard to do fixing it with the manifold in place and fixing those connectors or it would be annoying to have to pull the manifold off, but it would be simpler and probably quicker. In the end. I think it ended up being easier. Yeah. It was just, it ended up being a more expensive and longer spark plug change than I wanted it to be, but right. Cause I missed but that one connector. It is what it is. It's that's how it works sometimes. It's and fine. It, your father's daily driver. So it beats getting a phone call down the road where, Oh, Andrew, my truck stuck and uh, I need a ride. So that's good. Well, okay reliable yeah i helped him put it back together and um i had like some limited time yesterday to help him do it we got it mostly back together and then he was finishing up and he he told me it was running so it's fine that's all that matters it's actually uh fairly easy to work on there's plenty of room everything's like kind of makes sense the way it's set up what's all the connectors like you know, I was careful, like unplugging them, but everything came apart without like breaking. Other it's than a ripping that one off, engine, right? It's not like it's a no. That's a new. Engine. That's a new engine. That's a all aluminum V six. It's a six B something. It's not oh, a. It's not. It's not related to the six Gs. Mm-mm. Nope. Okay. No, it's got an aluminum block, aluminum heads. It's a six B something. I think like the four B. Okay. On. So I wonder yeah, if B, it's modern. I wonder if the B means aluminum. Maybe it used to be the the G was your gas and the D was for diesel. So you have four G, six G, four D. Yeah. Yep. And those were gas or diesel. So I wonder if B is some kind of a code for it to be an aluminum block. Interesting. Because the four B is aluminum too, I think, right? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. I'll have to look into that and report back because I do not know the answer to that. I don't know it either. It just never it never occurred to me. But yeah, that, that was a modern engine for that vehicle. You know, I just realized that I make fun of people for chassis codes, and here I am quoting en- Mitsubishi engine codes, which is like another level deeper, and I probably should stop. Well, it's interesting because those, that platform that came out with the Lancer in 2008, so yeah, now technically, yeah, it's an old engine now, but those were like, when they came out with that refresh, those were all new platforms, all new engines in 2008. Right. And they've kept those going for like 15 years now. So, well, the 4G engines came out in the 70s and they went until yeah. Yeah. 2009 or something. So, mm-hmm. that does make sense. So, whatever. It's fine. They run. It's good. Uh, it does not say here what the B means, but I'll do some deeper digging and figure it out. I was hoping to look really fast and see if it was there, but. It does not show it. Six B three is the is the base number, and then whatever the fourth number is is. Changed. It's a three five. So. So maybe it means three point five. Maybe it's a six B three five or something. Yeah. So yeah, it debuted in two thousand six. Hmm. So, crazy. Anyway, well, at least it's together and life is good and the truck runs. <laughs> that's the yeah. That's the important part. So. It looks like that engine is still produced exactly the same. Yeah, pretty soon we got to do it's coming up for a time and belt. So we got to do that. Oh, they're still belt driven, huh? Those are belts. Yeah, the four cylinders went to chains, but that's got a belt. But it's a 100,000 mile interval on those. So it's not too bad. Just something else to look for if you're looking at a used Mitsubishi of that era, which. Mm hmm. Obviously, all of us are. Which the V6 uh, in that truck, that's an XLS. I think it's an XLS. It's not a GT. The V6 came with the six-speed transmission, not a CVT. So it's a better transmission than the CVT, at least the way it drives. So it'll run forever. Yeah. Good. Anyway, neat. I know that's a variable vibe, t- variable valve timing and stuff, too, I think, on those. so. Yeah, it's got a lot of pep. I think it's like... 250? Uh, like... Internet says 227. Okay. Yeah, it's not a slug. It's it's good for that vehicle. 
that's more than the Nissan Rogue that I was, everybody assumed after talking about it, that I was waxing ecstatic and loved last week. I think I need to clarify that position too, but yeah. we went too far, actually. Um, we, they, they all thought that we lost you to the Rogue. You went Rogue. Yeah, I, I, I don't love the Rogue. And when I say that it was perfectly adequate at what it did, what, what, what it does and what it did, I, I don't mean that it's great. I just mean that in the current crop of vehicles that you can buy, um, the worst of the worst is actually okay. <laughs> and the Rogue might be the worst of the worst, but at the end of the day, it does its job well. So... I'm not going to run out and buy one. I'd recommend anybody run out and buy one. But if somebody were to come to me and say, hey, Brad, what do you think of a Nissan Rogue? I'm thinking of buying it. If they were a non-car person, which obviously they would be a non-car person, I would say, I've driven it. It's fine. I wouldn't have any, I wouldn't put push them away from it because if it's what they want, there's no reason not to buy it if it's what you want. Dynamically, it's not a car guy car. I wasn't saying that uh, I'm going to go trade in all of my old stuff for a brand new Rogue. Although, arguably, it is definitely a better car than all my old cars put together. But that is beside the point. It is not a great car in the grand scheme of new cars. It is just a car. It does car things as cars should. uh, And that's kind of where it stands. If you put me in the Rogue with no emblem on the steering wheel, and you were like, drive this car and tell me what it is, I would not have been able to tell you if it was a Honda Pilot or a Nissan Rogue or a Toyota um, RAV4 or a Hyundai Santa Fe or I, I would I couldn't tell you. They're you all a real. You need a real people Chevy ad. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. I could I could tell you actually. Okay, I could tell you it wasn't a BMW. I could tell you that it was an entry level average car, but it was definitely uh, a car. So we're, if we're grading things on the scale of uh, does it car? Yes, it card. So we were talking about that at Cars and Coffee today. That there, it is, it is rare that there are any bad cars. Yeah, there's really just not anymore. boring cars. Yes, a hundred percent. Like and that's like a Mirage is not a bad car. It's not a poorly built car. It's just a boring car. Yeah, it's ten. It's, 12 grand or 13 grand or so yeah. maybe more than that now but regardless it's 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 built to a price point and that's where it sits and the rogue is the same way it's it's a cheap crossover it does the things it's supposed to do and it does them competently yeah. enough that if it's boring but i enjoyed driving it because it worked if you want something nicer then you spend more money 100 percent. that's the way it works <laughs> that's 100%. the way car buying works I mean, listen, I'll, I'll say this right now. Like, we just bought a new car. I think last time we talked, we didn't have not taken possession yet. Nope. So let's just move on to that conversation, actually. Sure. We bought a brand new car in this household. Uh, well, I'll stop short. Record, at, record scratch. Yes. It's not yours. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll stop short at saying it's my car because it's not. It's Naomi's car. Um, but it's in the same household, and uh, I have to use it sometimes. And we purchased a... As far as price goes, bottom of the barrel car. But we bought one with options, so it was a little bit more money. And we got options that we thought would be nice for us to have. And it is... I don't want to say this and uh, and offend the recent car purchaser. Because it's, it's a good car. But again, it's not an exciting car. But what it lacks in excitement, it makes up in utilitarianism. So I think it's a little and, more exciting than a crossover because it's different. Because it's different, but it's, it's even it's though on, even though it's a Ford it's Escape style, it's it's well, it's not a Ford Escape, a hundred percent, only a little bit. So if you buy a Ford Escape, the drive line that you get is uh, totally different. The Ford Escape is a three cylinder turbo. Oh. The Maverick, which we bought, is a four-cylinder and a hybrid. So it does better fuel mileage-wise than even the Escape does. And it doesn't have that tinny three-cylinder sound, which is actually... Okay, I'm going to get myself in trouble again. The three-cylinder in the Nissan Rogue actually did not sound terrible. The three-cylinder in the Ford Escapes sounds terrible. I don't know what the difference is, 
but it's a big difference. The Ford Escape is very tinny with the engine. Um, the Maverick doesn't have that. Now, dynamically, yes, it's technically a crossover. But we chose this particular crossover because it has a pickup bed and it is more utilitarian. Um, I think it's a great choice. I think that for the options that you get, sub $30,000, you can't beat it. It costs actually less than that Rogue did. Uh, it's definitely quicker than that Rogue. Um, it's not a race car by any means, but that hybrid driveline gives it a little bit extra kick. Um, we bought the XLT package, which comes with a few extra things over the base XL. It has uh, alloy wheels, and I think the XL even has like no carpet and has like the rubber floor mats. This car obviously has, has carpet. Yeah. Um, it comes with uh, CarPlay, Android Auto. Um, we have the luxury package, which includes something we desperately need here in Phoenix, which is the heated seats and steering wheel. Oh, yeah. Yep. Actually, well, when you go up north. I, and, and I do, I, I will say I did use the heated seats in the Volkswagen in the wintertime because it does get down to the 30s here, so it is chilly. But nonetheless, it came with some other stuff too in luxury package too. But uh, And we got the towing package, which more for the tow hitch so that she can put her bike rack on the back versus um, bikes in the bed. So so it's got enough options to keep us happy. Uh, I don't think it doesn't have everything that the Lariat has, which is different seating services and stuff, but it's a, it's a really well thought out vehicle. Everything in it is neat. The textures don't feel as cheap as they did in the Nissan Rogue. Uh, some of the plastics feel a little bit cheaper, but it's again, it is a cheap car, so you have to expect that. But they just put a lot of textures in things that just are not needed, but make it visually interesting. And I think one of the cooler things that they did in the Maverick is with the XLT interior, it's a gray cloth seat, but it's almost like a, looks like a Henley, like a sweatshirt kind of gray. And it has orange stitching on that. And then it's coupled with on the dashboard, like on the, the, the HVAC vents have a little orange accent and the like cup holder inserts and the insert in the underneath the the radio and stuff in the front of the center console has an orange insert. So it's just these couple little colored inserts to match the piping on the seats. And it's, it's, it's a lot of cool little touches for a sub $30,000 vehicle. So I, uh, I think she did well in picking this vehicle and the, she got the area 51 blue, which is the, Oh, that was cactus. Nope. Gray. Cactus gray is gray, gray. Okay. And Area 51 blue is the kind of gray blue. It's if I had to simply describe it, I would compare it to your uh, cool gray khaki crosstrack, but a little bit more blue. Yeah, it's like every Bronco I see. Like I saw two yesterday in this color. Sure. And the cool thing is we did get a 2023, even though we were nervous. We weren't going to get our allotment because we were running close to the end and they canceled that color for 2024. So it's only the first two years we'll have that color. So you manage its color if you wanted. And do you know what Area 51 Blue refers to? Uh, no, I, other than Area 51? Yeah, well, that's what, that's what it refers to. The, the official government color on a map for a no-fly zone is that blue. Oh, okay. So they have that color blue over, obviously, Area 51 on any official government maps. So that's where the name came from, which I did not know. Naomi talked about that the other day, which is pretty cool. So it's a cool truck. I uh, I, I dig it. Like I said, it's I'm not going to sit here and say it's a sports car. It's not the most dynamically exciting vehicle to drive. It's just like anything else in its class. It's a good car because guess what? You can't buy a bad car. So it's a it's a good car. It drives nice. It's smooth. It's fairly quiet. Um, the tires are a little bit noisy, but they're Continentals and in general. Continentals are noisy. I don't, I've never had a really good experience with quiet Continentals, but if I had one complaint, that's probably it. The air conditioning blows nice and cold, which is important here. It has remote start. That's part of the tech package. And with the remote start, it seems to, based on ambient temperature, it will turn the AC on, even if you turned it off. Um, remote start obviously also is a bit of a, I guess it's a remote turn on, I guess, because it's a hybrid. 
So it will drive in battery only. And when you turn it on, like remotely in the driveway, it doesn't turn the engine on. It just turns the car on and starts the air conditioning pumping. So. Oh, so it's got, yeah. So it's got electric AC. It must. Yep. Mm Hmm. Yep. Interesting. Will it run? uh, Can you do like a pure EV mode with it? So you don't have the option of like turning the engine off, off, but it will run on pure EV for the first few miles. It will run pure electric. So it's very similar to a Prius setup. It will drive full electric like in your driveway. But then once you demand power, it will switch over to hybrid battery power. And then it has obviously has regen braking as well. Yeah. So, So, yeah, you'll end up using less brakes with the regen. Yep. Yeah, for sure. So she's put a full tank of fuel through. We got 540 miles or so before we put it. That's great. Yeah, it's really good. Um, And she averaged 40. Sorry, it's kind of got the aerodynamics of a brick. It's not. It like... does. We we averaged over forty miles per gallon. Yeah. So that's mixed city and highway. So that's really good. Yeah. So, no complaints. Yeah, but it's it's a good car, and she's and, and most importantly, she is one hundred percent in love with it. So she literally ordered it three hundred and seventy seven days before she took delivery, which is wild to think about it was supposed to be four months and then it was five months and then it was six months yeah. and then it was we'll let you know when it's ready and then it and was not having even driven one before right and then it was we'll let you know when it's ready and then it was you might not get it and then it was if you don't hear from us by this date put an order in for a 2024 because you're not gonna get your 23 and we we're like uh and then it was like two days before that date we got a VIN number which meant that ours was being built for 2023 which meant that we got the colors we wanted and the package we wanted without having to make changes. So uh, she, like I said, is 100% in love with it, and that's all that matters. I've driven it once so far, and it's uh, it's good. I, I enjoyed it. It's nice. It's comfortable. And uh, it's a, a worthy upgrade from the 251,000-mile 2011 Hyundai Sonata. So good truck. Cool. I guess we can project car update it real quick. We did a couple things to it already. Um, we yeah, had what'd you do? a spray in bed liner. So Ford offers a drop in bed liner, like a plastic one, which is whatever. Uh, so we got the spray in bed liner done at uh, the local place here called in Yachty. They do uh, all the new cars and all deals around here. Um, do an excellent job. So if you're in the Phoenix area, look those guys up. I don't know if it's a national chain or not. I think it's only in Phoenix. So it's similar to, what do you have in Massachusetts, Andrew? Is it uh, a couple different ones? But anyway, in Yachty. It's like Linex is, is the one you always see. Linex is the popular one. That's it. Which we have here too, I think. But so yeah, we used in Yachty and they were able to do it in like a couple hours, which I was a little nervous about because that bed has all kinds of cool features in it. It has uh, little ports and plugs and power and all kinds of different things in there. So they were able to do that for us. And then we had uh, Vader Tint. If you're in Phoenix, look those guys up. They're the same ones that did my Eclipse. They tinted the windows for us. So they did it so that the factory has a, a light tint on the back and then pretty much clear on the front windows. So she had them match that similar gradient, but make it like limo black on the back and then gradient to the same whatever difference it would have been between the two of the front. So it's nice and, nice and dark and cool inside as a car in Phoenix should be. So... Those guys are uh, they're here in North Phoenix, and it's the second car they've done for us. They did the Eclipse, and now the Maverick, and uh, good job both times. So, highly recommend those guys. But yeah, good stuff. So, hopefully, no more reports because it'll just be a car, and it will run, and it will work, and uh, there's no issues. So, I think we are getting it ceramic coated, which I've never had done before. So, I'll uh, maybe have an update on that in the future. But I'm curious to see how that stuff works. I have my uh, old car guy skepticisms, but I'm going to let it slide and make it work. So, yeah, that's it. Those are my car updates. That's a pretty good, that's a pretty big car update, I guess, huh? I will it is say, a pretty good, big car update. I, I will say the cool thing is, though, is that waiting for a car for a year, if you're disciplined and you can, you know, pay for the car anyway to yourself... By the time the car comes in, you have a much bigger down payment to make your payment way less, too. 
So by not having a car payment, we're able to make ourselves a car payment and then put a big chunk down. So that helps out buying a new car as well. So I guess you can do it with anything, right? You save enough, but it just seemed like we're like, okay, we can save this way. And then you save that way by forcing yourself to make a car payment to yourself. So anyway, cool, new car. Not the same as the old car. But that's it for car updates. What else we got, Andrew? Uh, I don't have much of anything. Cool. Yeah, so I haven't moved, touched anything. Well, I can move on to events. I did uh, Prescott Rally this weekend. Prescott is back. Prescott is back. First rally race since 2017. Whoa. And it was a success. Cool. So I think that it will grow as people realize that it's back every year. People from the area maybe need to get their cars put back together. <laughs> It was a fairly small rally. I think there were 28 cars totally signed up. And I think by Saturday we had 22 or 23 cars that started the event. So not a huge event, um, but also just a regional rally, not a national championship level rally. So it wouldn't have had any of the major teams come through anyway. But it was a small event put on by a small group of organizers. And it uh, went pretty much as smoothly as it could, I would say. I was given the role of stage captain for first view, which is the first stage on Saturday. And it's only run once on Saturday. Unfortunately, I couldn't make it for Friday because of actual real life and work obligations, but which means I missed all the drama Friday night. Uh, I can tell a quick story about that. It'll be a secondhand story, but supposedly. Um, how many stages did they run before we get to that? Uh, I think they were five on Friday and maybe three on Saturday. That's not bad for a little rally. Yeah, I think it was a hundred stage miles, which is yeah not... for a small regional. That's good. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it was pretty good. Uh, they did have to cancel one of the stages on Friday night. There was two separate incidents on the same stage, not the fault of rally people, just of locals, unfortunately. Yeah. One was a box truck. Like a, like a like a 23 foot budget truck driving down a stage road and okay. he was giving us a hard time about not being allowed in the road and then when he was turning the truck around to go the other way he almost fell off the cliff and then he's pretty belligerent and then the sheriff got involved and he wound up being arrested for DUI <laughs> so yeah. and they had to have a tow truck come get the box truck off a hill <laughs> so I was, was wondering about that because you you know, when we went there in 2010, side by sides were not a thing, but now they are. So, so the next issue were, was two yeah. people on side by sides that were also not sober that uh, found their way onto the live course after the triple zero and double zero went through and the yeah. single zero car was running through. So the issue is obviously you can block off all the roads. Yeah. But you can't block off the entire world. And side well, by yeah, sides it's, don't it's require a, a roads. Of, yeah, it's a lot of open desert. So Yeah, it's not like New England where you have tree-lined things that you can't even get a side-by-side -side through. This is just, you can you can drive something there. And side-by-sides don't follow the rules anyway. So two uh, rather, rather inebriated individuals, I guess, on yeah. separate side-by-sides caused the cancelization, cancel, cancel, yeah, cancellation of one of the stages Friday night. Um Thankfully, Saturday did not have that issue. Saturday ran pretty smoothly. I did have two vehicles come to our control um, that are pretty teed off at us. One guy's like, I've been driving for three hours, and I'm just trying to go you know, scout out some hunting spots. And we're like, well, if you've been driving for three hours, you can wait 45 minutes for the stage to finish. Like, you'll be fine. Also, yeah, that, also that deer happens. season's not open yet. So. Yeah, that... That happens here in Maine too. Well, it's like for what and and a bunch of rallies I've been to. You, they put up signs, you know, weeks, months in advance that says the road is going to be closed for X amount of okay. hours on yep. this date, and then you'll literally have annoying locals that are just like there to be angry, yep. show up and want to go on the road at that exact moment just to make a scene. Yep, and it's like, can can we just like. <laughs> Like we the gave you fair signs warning. Are, the signs never for them; they're for other people. Yeah, 
So anyway, uh, so he was pretty teed off. Yeah, he, he yeah. was pretty teed off, but he didn't cause too much of a scene. Uh, he was vastly outnumbered. So, I mean, we were the first stage of the day, so we had tons of people there. <laughs> so he did not cause too much of a scene beyond being annoyed and angry. And a second that the sweep car left, he followed the sweep car on the stage. Cool. You want to stay in the dust of that car? Go ahead. Uh, that's yeah. Uh, we told you follow the green light. Once the green light goes, you can go. It's totally fine. So that's what he did. But other than that, it was a pretty smooth, pretty smooth uh, launch. So the clocks and stuff are all similar to New England Forest Rally. The rules are all similar. Uh, I did not recognize the the cards, like the the I don't know what you call the card that the co driver time cards. On. Time card. Thank you. I uh, didn't recognize the time cards. They were slightly different than what I've seen in the past. I think that's a California Rally Series thing. I think they're yeah, maybe they are regional card. Uh, it, they get, it made they perfect run rally times. safe and stuff. Um, there was no rally safe safe on this rally if they do rally it if they do run it or I wasn't okay. involved with it if they do run it. But yeah. there was no like slow time does. zones or anything. So it was, nothing I did had anything to do with it. So I, if they do run it, I don't know. Um, it was basically just, we had the two clocks, you know, the ATC clock and the start clock. And then we had two redundant non-display clocks at the same time on them, just in case. And as far as equipment goes, we had pens and clipboards and that was it. So, and, uh, two way radios, obviously, but that's all I had to deal with. So I actually had to get those things early cause I was not going to be able to be there for the Friday stages. So I had to go to Prescott Thursday and pick up all that stuff to get so I could show up Saturday morning because unfortunately I was opening stage, which means I had to be there at least a couple hours before stage start to get the road closed and to get everything set up. And I had to be in Prescott by 530. And then because the place, the meetup place for my team was about an hour from where the stage opened. So I had to go meet the team and then head to the stage and be there within a reasonable time, like six ish, six thirty, the latest. So we managed to get there by about six thirty. I always forget Early. that where you live now, you're literally like an hour and fifteen from like the main part of Prescott. Yeah, so I'm like forty five minutes outside of what you consider Prescott Valley, like yeah. Dewey. Um actually where your mother in law is is like forty five minutes from me. Yeah. Then yeah, the Prescottonian Hotel, which is where the same place it was when you and I went in 2012. Mm -hmm. It was the same like 2010. <laughs> what, was it 2010? Yeah. Dang, so long ago. <laughs> yeah, 15 um, years ago. <laughs> anyway, when you and I and Stephanie went in 2010, the Prescottonian Hotel is the same place where it is currently to this day. So that's the same place. That's where I had to be at 5:30 Saturday morning. And door to door from my door to that door with no traffic, obviously at 530 in the morning uh, is an hour and a half. So and it's a, it's a pleasurable drive at that time of day. I'll tell you that much. So and then we transited out from there. It was just me. I took 944 and my other team members were in a WRX, which was perfect because we took 89A out to Jerome from Prescott. Nice which was a great way to start the day. And then the rally stage is on a, a, a state road that comes off of the uh, downtown Jerome area. So I explored a part of Jerome I've never seen before, and it was neat to get out into the, out into the desert from there. So, and the road was recently graded actually. So it made it, it made it really cool. Um, and I know you're familiar with it, but for listeners, if you're not pull up uh, on, on the Google machine, the Prescott rally cut, it's kind of a famous turn at, at the Prescott rally where there's a road that's cut in between the rock faces, I guess. Yeah. So that road was an, a narrow gauge railroad for the mining company. Yep. Everything up there was pulled all the tracks and yep. there, now it's a road. So it's, a, it's blasted rock and the cut is a very narrow, like width of a train narrow section that uh, taking at speed because it's also a sweeping left or right, depending on which way the stage is going. It must be sketchy at speed, because when I went in there, I, I could see the cut from where our stage start was 
turns out it wasn't as close as I thought it was because the road winds in back around a lot before you get there. So it was a solid, I don't know, five or six miles from where I was by road, probably a mile by sightline. But anyway, I drove out there afterwards just because I wanted to see how tight the cut was and, and be in the cut and just kind of see it for myself and obviously take pictures of my car in it. We drove through it. there in 2010. Yeah, but it didn't mean as much to me then because I didn't know. Yeah. That. You know, the the whole lore wasn't quite there in my brain. Um, I know a lot more about it now, thanks to probably the internet. But the weirdest thing was I remember driving out. We had an Altima rental car, of course. Uh, the, we drove uh, under lo- the high tension lines on the way so out a lowered, there, and like a lowered rogue. Yeah, and, <laughs> and I remember like we could hear the electricity as we went under these high tension lines, sure. and like. We were all remarking that like the hair like went up. Yeah, <laughs> like, I, like, I mean, hey, really strong lines. Weird. We'll do that. <laughs> yeah, like weird. okay. I mean, listen, I coming to that event in 2010, I can trace back a timeline of my life. It's why I live here now. Yeah, you know, we we came to that event, and I saw that Arizona wasn't what I had been raised to think it was. It wasn't just cowboys and cacti. It was. There was a lot here. There's so many different environments from, you know, sea level to 12,000 feet and everything in between. And there's this forest that looks like here in New Hampshire and there's desert. That's what you think it is. And there's city and there's permafrost and there, there's everything. I, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing here. And coming and visiting that particular time is what gave me this like stretch goal of someday living in the Phoenix area. So it was cool to get back to the rally and, and not just be, cause we were here as a officially unofficial media last time. Right. Yeah. I was media, Directly. but and yeah, you guys media, were spotters. We were just, we were just, yeah, quote unquote spotters. So it was neat to come back uh, and be a little bit more involved and be involved in the volunteer side of things. And it, uh, I was a little bit uh, trepidatious for being named stage captain especially because I didn't know much about how things are done out here. I mean, obviously I've been involved in rally for a long time now. And that's what I, how many rallies captain? Yeah. Whoa, 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 whoa. (laughs) That's that's a hundred percent. What happened? I was talking to the guy and he's like, he's like, where are you from? I've been to the new England forest rally almost every year since like 2000 or so. And he's like, Oh, I was like, yeah, I've done volunteering. He's like, what have you volunteered for? I was like, well, I've done a few different things. I've done, you know, this, that, and the other things. Have you done timing? I was like, never for a rally. I was like, I've helped out with like rally cross and autocross and I've run some TSDs. And he's like, you've done a TSD? I was like, yep. And he's like, all right, then you're going to help out with timing. And I was like, okay, I, I've lost every TSD I've run. I don't know if you want me to do this. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I got, I got voluntold to be stage captain, but it worked out pretty well in the end. So it's really not difficult. You just write down numbers. So the, the biggest thing is wrangling your group together, making sure you have the right locations and have the equipment picked up ahead of time and just being involved. So it was cool because I've met a ton of new people and I know everybody in the rally community here now and uh, life is good. So it's a good time. So it was two day rally, Friday and Saturday. Uh, they were two separate events, which was cool. So they don't, they did not run concurrently. They just ran, you know, two days in a row. But when Friday was over, a whole new rally started on Saturday. So um, I think it was the same. It was not the same winter both days. So Friday was won by an open two-wheel drive car, which is which is kind of cool to see because normally you see the four-wheel drive cars dominating, right? Uh, it was a Ford Focus driven by Chris Miller and the co-driver is Christina Coates. And then the winner on the... Saturday event also was a two-wheel drive car driven by Kubo Cordish and Drew Carlson was a Ford Fiesta ST. So it was cool to see two-wheel drive cars out there winning. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up the Mitsubishis that ran. Uh, There weren't many. Uh, There was one on Friday and he won the open four-wheel drive class in a Evo 10. Unfortunately, that particular car did not finish on Saturday. He had a retirement, mechanical retirement. So, bah. 
the single zero car was a Galant VR4, uh, which obviously did its single zero car thing on Friday successfully. But on the transit back to the rally headquarters on Friday night, had an electrical issue. And they couldn't get it figured out in time for Saturday to run zero with the Galant VR4. Uh, problem was the electrical issue happened out on stage. And by the time they had retrieved the car and got it back to the hotel, it was like 3 a.m. by the time they got back. and had to be up the next morning at, you know, 5 or 6. So they did not get the car ready. And they transitioned the double zero car to a single zero car and just ran it a little bit slower than normally the single zero car runs. So Mitsubishi's had a bad time. But what else is new? You listen to the Auto Off Topic podcast. You're already aware of this phenomenon. So... They are reliable. Don't listen to Brad or Andrew. That was it. Other than that, it was all the typical stuff you see. Punch WRXs, punch old, you know, um, GC chassis and prezes, a couple of Civics, uh, two Mark IIs, Volkswagens. So just a typical typical crowd. I don't think there were, I was sorry, there was one rear wheel drive car and it was a BRZ that uh, did okay on Friday. I think they finished second overall on Friday. Uh, Tim Wickberg and Matt Trott. But unfortunately, they had a roll on Saturday. Did not finish Saturday. They're okay, but the car is not. So that's it. I'm like a little jealous that you went to a rally, and then I just remembered that we've got the first gravel trial coming up uh, next weekend. So oh, that's the replacement uh, for the rally sprints, right? Yes, SCCA just unceremoniously canceled rally sprints said we don't want to do them anymore uh, a bunch of the organizers of rally here in new england scrambled found a new club to sponsor and insure them and they're doing a gravel trial at uh, uh team o'neill so same location next week the... yeah yeah so what club is best, sponsoring best place to do them the sports car club of new hampshire that's what i figured those mm-hmm. guys rule i remember doing autocrosses yeah. with them and they were really like, I, I don't want to say they don't care because they do care, but they're way less bureaucratic about how, how they go around way around things. Yeah. So they're a much more uh, lighthearted. They do care about safety. It will be a safe event, but they're much more fun, I think. Yeah, than, uh, we've got SCCA. some friends that are running it. So I'm going awesome. to hang out and help out, do whatever, volunteer Fix so the car, now, whatever we got to do. You're jealous. I went to a rally. I'm jealous. You're going to a rally with everybody that we know. Yeah. I had to meet all new people. I want to go see my friends race. <laughs> but I guess that's because I ran away. My own fault. Yep. Anyway, well, I was hoping to come back next year for the New England Forest Rally, but I guess that's up in the air. So we'll see what happens. So There might be a regional. We'll see. I think there will be a regional. I, I really do think there will be, but will I come out there for a regional or not? I don't know. So it probably will. Why not, right? See our friends race. Uh, we'll see. I want to see our friends race. I want to see. I want to see. I want to see Liz race. I want to see Jordan race, and go from there. And everybody else, just those two yep. in particular. But anyway, uh, that's all I got for the rally. Uh, look for the yeah. dates for next year coming up. They're supposedly going to do it again, um, as long as they can get all the permissions, and uh, the more the merrier. And also, it's one of the prettiest areas in this Phoenix, greater Phoenix area to go to. So the vistas on stage are ridiculous. Ridiculous. So it's worth it just for that, if nothing else. Cool. Did you watch NASCAR race, Andrew? I did watch most of it, yeah. Um, Dega. They Dega. They were at Dega. Um, man, my boy Chastain. Yeah, he had what a, a tough time. break there. Yeah, <laughs> that, unfortunately, it was nobody's fault. No, it wasn't. It was just like a bad. Yeah. And he, he, even interviewing, he's like, "I I went for a gap. I probably shouldn't have." Well, he didn't really have he a just choice. Got cut up because he could have let off. Happened. He said, "Yeah, maybe, but that's not racing." He was you like know. shooting a gap and the car, I don't know, was it the 43 or something came so down? Four, and just... So Ricky Stenhouse Jr., the 47, ran out of gas. Yeah. Um, he went to flick to his reserve and the car stumbled and slowed down. Yeah. 
Bush was behind him in the eight car and checked up a little bit, and they both went into the wall. And when they both did that, Chastain was behind them. and was like, well, they're slowing down. I'm going to swing around them. But when he swung around them, he made contact with the 20 car, I think. One um, of them came back down off the wall and into into Chastain. Into and pushed Chastain him and, and I put think him the into the wall. Car. Yeah. <laughs> which spun Chastain into the wall, which took him out of the race for the day. So yeah. that that burned a little bit. Uh and then Wallace had a great run going and just got shuffled back at the last pit stop. That's the interesting thing about super speedway racing is uh the tactic of like you'll just just bump somebody out into a lane that there's no cars and they just instantly fall back. Right. Like it's a that's real what interesting with tactic. Him and, and Busher. Yeah. So Busher was behind him and turned down into the lane, made, made, made a fourth lane next to him, but nobody was there to help either one of them, which was dumb. So yeah. when he got next to him, two cars side by side run slower than yep. two cars front to back. So the second he got next to him, they were so close that it took all the, the arrow away and both cars just fell back to mid pack. They were they literally there for showing whatever arrow package they have right now. They, they have to run like nose to tail to get the yeah. most speed. They basically it's crazy. Touch. Yeah. Yeah. They basically push each other around the racetrack at 210 miles an hour. Absolutely insane. It was a really good race though. Um, it was very clean. There was tons. It was very interesting watching all the different strategies well, and all the different except for the big one. <laughs> it was the last lap. It was fine. That red flag. No, the red flag. I wouldn't really call it a big one. There were only like five cars involved. Yeah, I mean they did have to but... fix the wall and they red flagged the race, but yep, yeah. But again, other than that, it was a pretty clean race. The only it other was. yellow for an incident was because there was it was the last lap of the first stage when Chastain hit the wall, but it was going to be yellow anyway. And they threw a quick yellow because there was stuff in the back stretch at one point. But other than that, it was a pretty clean race. So it's funny watching them on the super speedways after restarts because normally on a restart you can really see the difference in the cars accelerating but on a super speedway it's really just all the cars are just kind of accelerating at the same rate nobody gets that like huge jump off of off the corner because they get, they're doing full speed off the corner already or full yellow flag speed there's not like that waiting for i don't know something about it's different it's not restarts aren't as exciting on the super speedways so there's less seems to be less of a less of a chance to take a big advantage on a restart. The biggest advantages on a super speedway are always in the pits. And then choosing the right partner to draft with in the lines. So yeah, it was it was a good race. It was very entertaining the whole time. I watched start to finish and I was not was not bored. So Oh, was, the finish was great. The finish was amazing. It was 12, I really thought Harvick had it and I was like, oh man, that'd be cool because he's retiring. Yeah, his last super speedway race. It was 12 one thousandths of a second. Yeah. <laughs> like 12 one thousandths. Of, it doesn't get any closer than that. So, and everybody behind them was also wrecking at the same time. Like, I think, yeah. I think uh, Chase Elliott finished fifth backwards. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. it was definitely a good finish. Crazy race. But I'm not terribly upset that Ryan Blaney won. Um, no. I'm not anti Ryan Blaney, so that's fine. He's been around for a while, but I was hoping somebody else was going to win, but it's all good. And then next week is the Roval at Charlotte. Mm-hmm. So that should be a good one. That's probably one of my favorite road courses now. So many road courses. It's cool. Ah, it's so good. But Charlotte has some, for an infield race course, it has some pretty good elevation change. Yep. It's fun to watch, but I enjoy it. That's the one last year where I think it was, was it Larson that had no brakes going into the turn one last year and just T-boned somebody? Wow. I think so, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, that should be a good race. And that's the last race of this portion of the playoffs. And then they go into the eight remaining drivers in the playoffs after that. So I think. Yeah, because there's only like few more weeks because the last race is in november and that's in phoenix so yep and i can't get tickets yeah it's already sold out so frustrating i i I can get tickets for the mountainside but it's outside the track like you literally sit in the side of a mountain and watch the race yeah um which i mean if i got them like free cheap to free or free to cheap i might do but i don't want to pay 
fifty bucks plus a ticket. Oh, because it's not of a mountain. It's still in track properties. You can't just like hike up there. Correct. Yeah. Uh, you can't just be there. If you can just be there for free, yeah, I'll go watch it. That's cool. Yeah. But I, I think it's it's not it's not that. So I think I looked and they were like fifty bucks. So. Hmm. I don't know if it's worth it. Just go sit inside a mountain. We'll look into the spring race. For sure. If it's not sold out already. I don't think so. I don't know. We'll see. I don't think they're selling tickets yet because it's, they only just started selling tickets for Daytona. So that leaves below the cut line right now is Bush, Wallace, Chastain, and Redick. Mm. So one of those four drivers has to do very well next week to get moved ahead of yep. Keselowski. So I'm actually surprised Keselowski beat out Reddick at the end because Keselowski mm-hmm. crashed out of this race and he was below the cut line when that happened, but he's uh, up by six points only. So mm-hmm. <laughs> real close. Is okay. there anything else? I don't think so. All right, cool. So, uh, you can follow us on Facebook if you want. Odd Off Topic Podcast. Odd Off Topic on Instagram. Uh, we're on threads if you want to try it. It's kind of up and down over there. Are we there? I'm re- What's that? We are over there? I didn't, didn't know yep. this little thing. I thought that thing failed already. No, nope, it's, it's still going. It's, it's chugging along. Just a little slow. Um, still time to get in the bottom. Yeah. Uh, I am on Instagram, Race and Anger, and pretty much anywhere else. Come join our Discord, because it's really fun over there. Lots of stuff always going on. It is. Uh, Ample opportunity to make fun of Andrew and and myself. That's right. Or some other people that kind of deserve it sometimes. Sure. (laughs) It's all in good fun. (laughs) It is all in good fun. It's like fun teasing. Um, Anyway, where can they find you? Uh, They can find me at most of those same places, but my username is TSISS350 on Instagram. And we're on Instagram also as Scale Autocast. Yeah. I got some new stuff to go in there. I'm going to get to it. Yeah, I have tons of stuff, which I haven't taken any pictures since I've been busy. Mm-hmm. So. All right, cool. As always, keep cars analog and aim the roses.